feel the pains out there that actually go on and hear the grumbles, the moans, the mumps and pains, and they can put the world to right. They should be the world readers in taxi drivers. I think the same is what we're going to try and get out of the gentlemen here today in trying to figure out what their customers are really looking for, the pain points and the new emerging challenges they're seeing in both energy and environment. And again, another topic we've been speaking about today is the value of this information from the top to the bottom, left to right. And we've got that reflected in our panel again today. We've got Francis, uh, ex-CSO himself, working very much within the rules of granularity in a meaningful way. Um, by uh, senior management is a, re a recurring theme that I have to say I see almost on a daily basis. It, it, it only slightly eclipses the second problem, which is how you actually take this data and turn it into meaningful, uh, to get meaningful value from that data with your stakeholders. Because there again, you're in a position whereby there's a lot of people concerned, they want to know how you're doing, most of them are very enthusiastic, have a very positive a priori, but I'll be damned if three quarters of them don't understand a word of what you're talking about. Right? Uh, and, and again, don't have the technical background or the contextual background against which they can properly evaluate what you're trying to say to them. So I would call that the, the translation problem, which then leads very naturally into the, the, the second issue that we see, which is the comprehension problem. To actually take that metered, metric data say that, metric data, and then to turn that into what does that mean in terms of the business? Now, as I tried to allude to this morning, there's, of course, there's a notion of, you know, turning off the lights and you save money and, you know, and your electricity bill goes down. Okay. But I believe that the inherent value of this data goes way beyond that. And I would even posit that its, it's extra financial value or its non-financial value is actually considerably greater. Because if you're thinking about how your energy management methodologies and your whole approach and strategy to it can be used to build reputation and then look at what's the value of reputation for a company today, then I, I think that there's that second area where I believe that the data can be shown to have extremely high added value. Great, thanks. And Chris, in terms of the, the focus we are seeing on energy management within commercial real estate buildings and portfolios and benchmarking, and again, maybe just going on to what a bit of Francis was saying there, like to try and establish value, you need historical data and benchmarking to put yourself um, against uh, peers to, to really look outside even your own organization because you can sometimes be too filtered. But what challenges are you seeing in, in terms of that space then when it comes to benchmarking and firms actually fully understanding their place in the entire ecosystem of the world? Yeah, so um, first of all, thanks for having me. And um, I guess by way of um, background on our company to put sort of my comments in context, Gobi um, started in 2008 as a uh, energy and sustainability consulting firm uh, focused on commercial real estate. And we quickly uh, realized that what we were doing is capturing a lot of data and the same bits and bytes of data were being captured and kind of moved to many different places. So we uh, built a platform that basically supported our consulting group, which the mission was to run better buildings. And we sort of landed on this motto of capture once, report anywhere. But to follow on uh, Francis's comment, which I thought were very astute, we've um, quickly gotten to that this notion of data needs a service or needs some action. And the reverse is also true. We, we also, service also needs data to be, uh, to make accurate decisions. And so <clears throat> I'll give an example. So in New York, when they passed the energy benchmark, it was one of the first cities to pass such a thing. And what turned out is that they didn't require that the energy benchmark uh, actually had a licensed professional sign off on it. So I could go in the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. And for those who aren't familiar with it, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about um, kind of some of the basics of that. But anyway, it's an energy benchmarking tool. And what they found is that um, they created this sort of cheap energy benchmark. You have a bunch of service providers spring up that um, uh, sort of respond naturally to this um, benchmark or this market um, direction. And, and to follow on that, we also found that there was sort of this market created because part of the other legislation was that you would do these energy audits that met certain criteria with, that were part of the ordinance. And again, you get this market that's um, incented to basically cost effectively deliver just what the ordinance asked. 
And so what we found is that we need uh, service professionals that can provide quality service, but they also need data to be able to do this. And then we also need data to be able to validate what they did. I think that's, um, we've seen that within our business. We're, we actually started out building the platform our, for our consulting group, and um, we just had a, a large engineering firm license our platform uh, because of the pressure they were getting um, from their customers to not just provide a service. They also needed the data to, to validate what they were doing in their buildings. Um, so I think it's exactly what Francis said as far as we need actionable information, and then we need professionals that can deliver on that. Great, thank you very much. And um, Mark, again, I jumped the gun here and didn't give you all a chance to, to introduce yourself. So Mark and Joel, before you answer my questions, please do introduce yourselves and, and what you do. But the, the question I'll, we're looking at from you is more so in terms of looking at large manufacturers, what are the challenges you, you see coming from them? Sure. Um, my name is Mark Razor. Uh, thanks to my friends at Urgenet for having us here, Sanjay and Eric and Tim and Lauren in the back there. I'm not quite sure how I made the cut to be on this panel, but thanks for the confidence in me. Um, so my background is uh, in environmental health and safety management in the aerospace industry. I worked for Goodrich Corporation, uh, which is an aerospace and defense company. Um, I also did energy management uh, the last part of my stint there. And I didn't really find a tool that I liked for manufacturing. Um, to do energy management, to do all of the types of variety of data that manufacturers require. So about four years ago, we started Interscape, and that's really what we specialize in. Companies that are, like you said, large, so our clients are anything from a metal facility that has literally two miles of production lines to a, a semi-trailer manufacturer that produces 178 semi-trailers a day in three million square feet. So the challenge is inherently, how do you how do you identify the places we want to get the data? How do you get that data back to a central location? And, and so we've worked with lots of hardware vendors out there and basically created a system that can pick up data points from any specific point in the manufacturing process, whether it's individual air compressors, individual production lines, uh, water usage, gas usage, uh, electricity. And then when you combine that data with Urgenet data, now you can see the actual cost that it, that it that uh, the resources that go into operating each individual piece of equipment. You can see how much cost goes into each production line. So I think the, the largest challenge there is uh, simply trying to figure out where to identify the opportunities with manufacturers. And it all starts with, with capturing data. Okay. And actually, just whilst I'm on that, one thing I've found whenever I look at manufacturers, commercial buildings, there's no surprise lots of people are providing solutions. They all look vaguely the same. They all do vaguely the same thing. As soon as you go into a manufacturing facility, depending on what it's manufacturing, where it is, it can be completely different. How, how do you address those challenges through the fact that a one-size-fits-all solution will never be applicable in those industries? Sure, and, and great point. And like you say, a lot of times with manufacturers, the, the rule book gets thrown out the window because you've got to learn that company. So our process is to go in and spend quite a bit of time learning about that business, meeting with the different stakeholders in that business, the operators, the maintenance people, the, the people who are driving the strategy, and really understand what their goals are. And then on the actual uh, data side, we bring in either our engineers or a, a consultant to work with us and say, okay, uh, here's here's what everyone told us here. Now here's our opinions and here's our thoughts. And you know you may think that when you see a two me two megawatt arc furnace, that that is the main user in this facility, uh, because it's you haven't lived till you've seen a two megawatt arc furnace uh, melting fifty thousand pounds of steel at once. Let me tell you. But when you find out there's a hundred other pieces of equipment in a production line down there that are running twenty four hours a day, when the arc furnace only runs two hours a day, uh, the opinions of the people who are in the plant, and your initial opinion may be way off. So you really need someone who is an expert on that particular industry and that can and then start collecting the data and see, and, and so you can identify those surprises. Okay, great. And again, Joe, if you could just introduce yourself, but what we're interested in finding out a little bit more about from you is the challenges involved with getting your hands on this data and integrating the data that we might all have within our buildings but don't quite have it at our fingertips yet. Yeah, and it's it's a very real challenge. Uh, so first, Joe Amador with Lucid. Uh, Lucid is a energy management software provider. Uh, really, I'll I'll define a problem that really started the company. So a couple students, their professor, Oberlin, uh, Oberlin College, about ten years ago, 
were working in an environmental sciences building. It was built new. It was lead, uh, lead platinum. Should have been one of the most efficient buildings in the world at the time. And they found after about a year that it was actually twice as inefficient or used twice as much energy as all the other buildings on campus. And they said, what's going on? What, what's wrong? And since then, we've heard this story in other cases. But they found that the way to really save the energy was to engage the occupants. So the, the company started as a dashboard company giving real-time metering of visibility to those occupants through a dashboard, how much energy you're using, relating that to something that those individuals understand. So if it's a college, not just energy, but how much energy does that equate to in cost of pizzas? Because when a student says, well, our dorm is using 100 pizzas a night and the other dorms are using 50, that gets them. And, and there's been a lot of research since then published that one real-time data really drives that, that efficiency because it's more compelling, it's more interesting, it's more uh, in, enticing. But the challenge that we have had all this, this time is many of these buildings have different systems that they're, they're using. So uh, connecting to all of them is a big challenge. Uh, one of our goals is to reduce that challenge so that the systems that are out there we can connect to. I would say challenges still remain. Uh, in some cases, it does require hardware to put in the building. In other cases, it requires just a better understanding of where is your data residing today. Uh, and, and what we find is there are a lot of organizations where they know that they have different systems across the board. They may or may not really understand where is all that data. Uh, and then the integration piece, in some cases, it's not very time consuming at all. In some cases, it is a little bit time consuming. OK. And so we've gone through kind of from the top there of some of the challenges we've heard. And maybe it'd be interesting to run through the panel again and find out a little bit more what happens when people come up with these challenges and you see customers that, that are struggling. Um, because again, we've, we've heard a lot from if you put data into the hands of people who don't know much about it or what to do with it, that can even just present a new challenge. It's a different challenge, it's, but it's a new one. But again, how, how do you help your customers overcome this new challenge of taking action upon some of the issues which they come across? Generally, that's uh, generally that's something that we do within the context of the particular industry for for a, a given kind of customer. So what you tend to have are, are things like you know expert groups and forums who will basically help these people to decide what what is the best way to uh, to present their different kinds of data. Where we then come in is then obviously to help them to build out all of the different templates, whatever stylized uh, dashboards that they need. But beyond that, um, we also provide a service whereby we can take the company's financial data and directly start tying the financial data to their sustainability data, be it their electricity, be it their water, their waste, recycling, human resources, whatever it is. And so that then allows you to start building a, I would say, a, a business narrative around that particular data set and then bring you towards the goal that I was saying of making it items that become more easily understood and more easily acted upon by senior management. Yeah, so that's uh, it's an interesting question. One of the um, most interesting things that we've seen is this sort of, um, and I think Tim might have brought it up earlier, this sort of notion of gamification, and, and Joe touched on it with the pizzas. Um, we found that if we can quite simply take and we have customers that have real-time data um, and look at that. Um, but if we even take it up to the 10,000 foot level and we get whole building data, uh, and we find if we can normalize that sort of on a monthly basis and present that, and then stack rank uh, their a, a building portfolio or competitive set, that will actually, um, these are smart people that are typically operating. You have smart people providing the service. Um, we can give them some predictive analytics on what we would expect, but we see the competition, sort of the notion of, oh, my building's better than Joe's or what, you know, whatever it might be. We've noticed an 8 to 12% drop just by presenting the data in a normalized fashion and letting people sort of compete. I think um, I had seen something where Opower estimates something similar. As soon as they put your uh, neighbor's usage and sort of the block's usage on your residential bill, they see a 12% percent decline. So I think there's one notion of getting basic data, which in a lot of cases is this sort of um, utility bill information, and starting there, because it's not terribly expensive at this point. Uh, and then as we get more, we get more pieces of data, we can be a lot more predictive and, and kind of point people in the right directions as we dive deeper into it. 
So um, one way that we help our clients is, is trying to identify a knock your socks off project right out of the gate. So if we've got people that have goals, they, they know they need to be sustainable, they know that they need to have these types of goals, okay? But from the CEO down to the maintenance person, there's a lot of disparity in what those opinions are. But everyone can agree that saving money is a good thing and reducing either water usage or gas or electric is good. So we try to identify a project uh, that gets everybody on the same page. And one example was uh, one of our clients that we monitor all their electricity and gas uh, called us and said our w water bills are going crazy. We have no idea why one quarter it's three times what it was last quarter, et cetera. So we went in and, and not just monitored at the main, but we submetered uh, throughout the building. and. Uh, we, they told us they had done some studies and, and you know, we're trying to put in high efficiency toilets and fix leaks here and there, whatever. So after we collected data for about three months, we found out that 98% of their water usage was going to one room in the back, the water treatment area, which if you're a facility person, you understand that, and 2% was being used in the other 100,000 square feet, including the office. So if you're going to focus your efforts on one area, you focus on the 98%. So and when we compared that to the other building that had a similar room, this, this building was using 9 million gallons of water a year. The other facility was using about 3 million gallons of water a year, and they were similar. So with our, with our understanding and with our uh, expertise on that, we said, let's focus here and let's, let's save you guys some money. And so uh, by helping them put in some controls um, on their cooling towers, they've reduced their consumption by 5 million gallons. And no one argues with that. The CFO sees all of his bills cut in half immediately. The plant managers are just, you know, they're saying that's great. We're on board with this now. So getting everybody on the same page and finding a really great project to start the relationship is, is what we like to do. Yeah, a, uh, a story that I can tell, a recent meeting I had with, with a large company in, in the Bay Area, uh, we went into the meeting and there were the usual suspects there. There was a facility manager, there was an energy manager, a couple of people from the energy management group, uh, sustainability. And when we first got there, we met a number of, of, of challenging questions from the facility manager around what, what differentiation can we provide, what value can we provide, because those buildings were actually all on the same building automation system. And, and from his point of view, he had everything he needed, all the visibility he needed. What we found, though, in talking through uh, a different a variety of different scenarios was that every single other person in the room, which you would expect to have access to this data, had no access to this data because they were not connected. They did not have access to that building automation system. So we were able to bring them, we were able to bring the idea to them of, wouldn't you all like to have visibility into energy usage? Wouldn't you all like to know when your buildings are not shutting down on time, why they aren't shutting down on time? Moreover, one of the one other piece of information we found they were managing their buildings such that certain facilities, certain org parts of the building, they were just not actively managing. They said, you know, that's a lab. That's where we're innovating. We don't want to touch it. But we were able to tell them and show them, well, what if you gave those individuals, you're not doing anything, but give them some visibility into how does this part of the wing or this part of the building compare to the, the same type of wing, same type of building on another side of the office or other side of the facility. Let's compare them. And, and by comparing them, they're not doing anything, but they're letting those people know, you know, you're the only ones now that are leaving your lights on all night. Maybe you should turn them off. And, and that was another compelling point where we're bringing some of that information to people who want it, that don't have it. And then we're also allowing, not, not changing schedules, not, not telling people, you know, lights are going off at a certain time, but letting them learn that, understand that, and actually make those decisions on their own. And, and I think those are, are by, by democratizing this information, you can get those types of, of outcomes. OK, great. And one thing that's come up a few times today has been Energy Star and Portfolio Manager. It's, I think it's been, it's been really successful. We've heard today it's not always fantastic. UPS struggle with there's not quite enough things set out for a distribution center. But generally, it, it's pretty good. But UPS explained one challenge there. So maybe, uh, Joe and Chris, if you could explain a little bit more of your experience with Energy Star, some of the benefits, some of the challenges, and what you do again to help customers really maximize the opportunities and the value of such a, a valuable data set that's now been put together in North America. Yeah, I think I think um, uh, being that um, we were uh, we were the Energy Star Partner of the Year last year, I think we have some insights, and we spent quite a bit of time in there. Um, one of the things I think fundamentally that it did is uh, there's this sort of notion that everyone has big data and access to big data. And um, what we actually found in our vertical, in the real estate vertical, that it was very siloed. 
So you'd have uh, someone maybe tracking it in Excel in one way and reporting on it in one way. Uh, but we actually had more of a dark data scenario where we weren't really having access to all this data. So I think Portfolio Manager came along, and it's not certainly not perfect. You can uh, poke a hole in it. Um, it's sort of a benchmark tool that will take your building type and attributes and, and <clears throat> try to normalize it as best it can for usage types, so data centers, retail, those kind of things. So certainly it's not perfect, and, and you can, like I said, poke a hole in any of these scenarios. But what we found is that it got everybody's data in one place. So we, we all sort of had a level playing field, and we could start looking at data, um, although they were relatively kind of they weren't terribly granular data sets. Um, we could at least start with that as a, as a kind of level playing field. And what we sort of subsequently found, so uh, I had mentioned the New York City benchmark. Uh, I'd worked with the city of Chicago, where our headquarters are, um, as they were putting together their ordinance. And, and you know, in typical Chicago fashion, had to be better than New York. So you know, whatever New York did, they were going to do it better. And so they looked and said, all right, you know what? They use Energy Star. Throw that away. We're going to come up with our own benchmark. And what they, we beat it around, and we landed right back on Energy Star. And we found that it was, it, it was run by the EPA, so there was no commercial interest per se. Uh, it was the best we had. It was the most widely adopted. And so even though it has its um, challenges and it's not perfect, I think um, as a base entry platform, that's the most common place we've seen. I was recently at a conference, and they um, did a study, and 100% and of the people in the, at the conference, and granted, this was energy and sustainability and real estate, but 100% of the people there used Energy Star as their energy benchmarking platform in a base case. Now, most who had gotten past that initial had adopted you know, some platform that's probably in the audience here or up, up here on the stage, but I thought it was pretty telling that that is the starting place for all of the energy benchmarking out there. So, so we're very much proponents of it in that sense. I think it's a great place to start. There was a great, um, a great study in the Journal of International Money and Finance where they, where they basically taken the greenness of real estate investment trusts and um, plotted, could they um, plot stock performance against, could you outperform if you invested in a green portfolio? And what they found was that <clears throat> because you know, for, for portfolios that were he more heavily uh, in the Energy Star or had achieved Energy Star, they actually outperformed the market because you sort of had these unexpected results because of operational efficiencies they were able to gain, which they didn't find with LEED, which was interesting. They sort of had figured the LEED buildings, that was public information that was sort of valued into the stock price. But when you're energy efficient, you could sort of outperform the market, which I found really interesting. And you're doing that with a basic energy, energy tool, such as Energy Star. Yeah, the, the only points I'll add, uh, Energy Star, of course, it gets people talking about energy, talking about performance. It gives them at least a metric or a couple metrics, but a, a core Energy Star score metric that allows somebody to look across a portfolio and even share that information with other like buildings and figure out, am I doing well? Am I doing not so well? And that's one question that always comes up. You can tell somebody about their building and they typically ask, well, am I doing well? How, how am I doing? And uh, Energy Star is also good from my point of view because when you're using software, you may have that desire for more software. So it becomes uh, a, a compelling way to begin a conversation. And then th the data in Energy Star, you, there are ways you can exchange with Energy Star and you can pull that historic data with permission of that, that building owner. And from our point of view, if we're trying to validate an energy efficiency project, having that historic data is very important uh, because in some cases that's the main place where it's been, it's been uh, saved and been, been collected. Uh, so there's a number of, of, of valuable pieces. And then, of course, there's the regulation aspect where uh, certain cities, about 15 of them now and more to come, are requiring all buildings over a certain square footage. Sometimes it's 50,000. Sometimes I think it's 200, 250,000 square feet. They're required to, to get a score every year. And then in some cases, it's being published down to the address and the score. And in other cases, it's just averaged across. You know, in our city, this was the average Energy Star score. Here's the median Energy Star score. Here was the spread. Uh, so. If you actually name the buildings, the individuals that have the six and the nine and the 10 Energy Star score are probably much more likely to start trying to make, make improvements, but also try to make those improvements maybe before they have to submit that information. So all in all, I think it's, it's good. It, it's moving us in the right direction. I have definitely seen an uptake in interest in Energy Star and discussions about Energy Star since these municipal benchmarking regulations uh, started starting being passed, which a couple years ago, I think, two or three years ago, uh, maybe a couple more than that.
Okay, and and Mark, moving on to benchmarking, but maybe in the industrial sectors again, the research that I did found many firms which they may be an individual king of his own castle. He's in charge of his own budget. Um, he makes all the decisions, pulls all the shots, thinks he's doing a great job, communicates information up, but doesn't even know how he's performing relative to his peers in the same organization. Are you seeing a need for firms to be able to benchmark their, themselves within similar manufacturing industries? And how do you see that developing? Is it going to be something along the, the same lines as Energy Star? Um, I, I would say so. The Department of Energy produces, uh, you know, some data based on the different types of manufacturing. So there, there are some benchmarking tools out there. Uh, that is one of our goals is to help other companies within industries understand and, and help benchmark. So we've worked with a lot of different injection molders. And so we've got data specific to the injection molding business. So we can talk to other injection molders about this is this is what we've seen as kind of a standard in your industry. About 60% of your energy usage is going into your product. 40% is going into facilities or additional areas. So I think that uh, benchmarking externally is great and also benchmarking internally. Um, a lot of companies, like you said, King in their own castle, they sometimes we overlook our flaws and they don't, uh, they don't always see things that they could be doing better. So for example, a uh, plant in Florence, Kentucky, we submetered four individual production lines that all are producing uh, steel to make automotive springs. They make 70,000 springs a day. After submetering those four production lines, we didn't know anything about the lines. We just pr provided the data. And I got a phone call immediately after we sent the report to the client to say, hey, here was our results. He said that the two lines that use 36% more energy than the other two lines are our new ones. Those are the ones that we bought from Germany that were high efficiency. They produced 30, they had 36% more energy consumption and only 4% more product output. So we kind of shook the boat on that, or rocked the boat on that one, if you, if you want to say that, because they had been sold these supposedly higher efficient lines. Now, we don't know if it was the line they bought or the way they were running it, if it was training, if it was the operators. We don't know. But now they have data, and they know that just benchmarking internally, we should know how many kilowatt hours go in each foot of spring that we manufacture, and we don't know that. So that's, that's where it starts. Okay, great. And then Francis looking at right up to the next level, we've got portfolio manager looking at individual buildings or potentially doing manufacturing sites in North America. But if you're a global organization and you want to have that data, similar levels of data and do similar levels of benchmark, are there opportunities for firms to do that at the, the, the global level? And does Workiva help them to do so? I would have to say the answer is yes and no in the sense that I am sure that there's somebody out there who can help them to do that. That is not a problem that any of our customers to date have asked us to tackle. So my answer would be yes and no. Okay, so again, when it's very difficult, we see graphs and metrics, you used one yourself, of uh, those in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index outperforming um, everyone else. It's, again, sometimes we see the larger, more successful companies adopting sustainability, not always, but who do you compare against a Coca-Cola or a PepsiCo and their financial performance? How do you separate the actual real value which sustainability has on performance when using that type of assessment? You could write a book on that question. Um, it's re it's re really, really not an easy thing to do. It, it usually depends on the perspective of, of an individual investor. So, for example, if you're talking about a, a pension fund, pension fund is essentially looking at investments that are on a minimum of a 25-year time scale. Often it's even more because they have to provide you know, funds to support people into the very far future. If you're talking about real estate folks, who sometimes can take a very short-term point of view, then you know, the metrics that you're going to look at to, 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 to analyze to see which of those investments is, is going to be the best is, is definitely going to be uh, significantly, significantly shorter. I would say that you know, when, we were, uh, when, when I was uh, running sustainability at L'Oreal, so put on a different hat, um, I, I would say that we, we benchmarked ourselves against the people who we felt were simply the absolute best. Uh, it was part of our part of our mantra was to be better than the best. Uh, very competitive firm, uh, as you know, uh, and so we would simply go out and find in any given category who was going to be the very best, and and just brutishly benchmark ourselves against them. 
irrespective of who they were. Okay, great. And I've, I've just got one question to put to the whole panel. We saw Eric trying to encroach on my stage. How dare he? Um, uh, it's my time, Eric. Uh, <laughs> uh, just one thing. <laughs> I, I've done a lot of work with the CDP data. And the CDP have done a great job in terms of trying to promote people, putting in data and metrics. But if anyone's actually ever tried to use that data, you would quickly know you'd want to get your hands around the neck of anyone who's putting it in. It's full of errors and mistakes. Just briefly, before Eric comes on, like, how important is it that if we're collecting this data, we at least put the time and effort in that it's good, quality, accurate information? I guess I'll start. We, um, I was at a Bloomberg conference recently, and, and their focus was on um, ESG, or environmental, social, and governance, uh, and collecting that information from their public uh, real estate investment trust, because their investors were asking. And we got right back to the fundamental question of, well, if people are going to make investment grade decisions on this, it better be accurate. And so how do we do that? And you know, I don't know that there's a perfect answer. And I think everyone sort of left, left that conference um, with that answer is we're starting to collect it. We're probably on the energy side, a little bit ahead of where we are, maybe on the water and waste side. Uh, certainly, those are the three focus areas. And I think um, we'll only start to see those improve. And I think that's where a platform like Urgenet is quite helpful. Um, but I think we're in the early stages and we're getting that data. And it's even, what do you do with it? How do you compare it against each other once you have it? And I think we're, we're kind of in the early stages from what I'm seeing uh, with that. Um, I mean, you got to have accurate data. It's, you know, we're, we're a data company. Uh, we submeter and data is everything. You live or die by the data. Garbage in, garbage out. That's, that's the end of the story. Um, we, we, you know, you, you learn a lot from your failures, right, or mistakes you make. Well, four years ago when we started the company, we got a lot of data and saw something that looked really fascinating for one of our clients and couldn't wait to share it with them. And fortunately, it was, it was a, a university that we were working closely with on developing the product. But we jumped the gun showed them the data and you know they spent time trying to figure out what it was well we made a mistake we had a factor wrong in our in our computation we made that mistake one time <laughs> so <laughs> after that we learned our lesson but you you have to have accurate data period i'll only add that uh, i think we're moving in the right direction for sure i remember years ago when having an energy management software product meant that you had a way that somebody could key in utility bills so we've come a long way from that uh, I would say that on, on the, the submetering side, when you're trying to get real-time data, you're trying to give it to somebody within 15 minutes, maybe even less than 15 minutes. So you want to make sure it's correct. Uh, at the same time, you deal with a number of challenges. If a meter goes offline, if a meter flatlines for a certain period of time, uh, there are ways in the software that we can, we can detect spikes, for example, detect those, give visibility to what's happening. Uh, I know that in the past, some ch sometimes you come across meters that aren't reporting data and you don't learn about it for three or four days. So being able to, to give that information very quickly is important. Uh, so, so, so from my point of view, it, it's moving in the right direction. And there's a number of different ways that, that, that we can solve that. All right. Welcome to the stage, Eric. Um, yeah, I, I hate to cut the panel short. This is a great discussion. We're just running a bit behind time. But I did promise someone at the break that I would ask the panel this one question. So maybe you could each respond briefly to it. And that is, what are the key innovations that are underlying your applications or services? Okay, uh, a couple a couple things that, that we see that that are, are really driving us. Uh, when you look at, at at a high level, when when we look at the the residential building space, we see a lot of innovation from being able to have a light bulb that is IP addressable, having a thermostat that's IP addressable, and a lot of that innovation hasn't quite yet made it to commercial buildings. But that's one of the only cases where you can actually say it's more you're more innovative on the, the residential side than on the commercial side, because you have millions of dollars being spent on commercial buildings. And you'd think it'd be more in innovative. So the opportunity there for us is, is having more types of, of devices and equipment that we can connect to, that we can make it easier to connect to. Uh, we can pull that into one place so that if you are a, a organization that maybe still has pneumatic thermostats, maybe you want to, to move to something that is actually far more advanced. but you don't necessarily want to use the, the Nest iPhone app to manage you know, a, a, a group of 50 buildings, uh, because that, that just wouldn't be very, very scalable. So from our, our point of view, that's, that's one of the, the, the big innovations, the fact that, that there's more opportunity to manage energy, and there's an opportunity to, to bring those innovations to the commercial building space. I'll keep this very brief, because Eric looks like he wants to get to the party. So um, 
the, one of the greatest innovations for Interscape is Urgenet, and it's what DJ and Tim showed you guys before the panel discussion. That's one of the greatest innovations for our company uh, because we specialize in the submetering and getting down in the details. They specialize in the bills and the financial data. And if you look out in the solution zone, we can show you what kind of things you can get when you combine those two forces, and it's really impressive. So uh, I think that's the greatest thing for us right now is Urgenet. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we're trying to look at is this abundance of data and, and finding unique ways to use data. So I'll give an example. When we look at determining the carbon footprint of a building, it's pretty easy to get sort of the scope one and scope two, basically the, the energy that's consumed um, in running the building. What's harder is getting the footprint of all the people that, that end up there. So short of polling everybody, we've actually found a, a company that buys scrubbed cell phone data that can basically track your GPS so they know within a region how everybody gets to work, the path they take, what public transportation they take. Um, so can we take that data then and, and estimate a carbon footprint for a building based on how everyone gets there? So we're looking at ways to simplify what the end result is, is which is this carbon report, but without uh, inconveniencing and taking this massive brain surgery to figure it out. What's that? No, it's, it's not. It's a small startup. Huh. Definitely don't want brain surgery. Not at this time of day. <laughs> There's an expression in Dublin that says, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. You know? <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> if, I, if, I like, if I could an give two answers, Eric, if you don't mind. Yes. One would be the answer for today, and the other would be the answer for tomorrow, if that's not a cheat, a way of getting in two okay. answers. I would say for today, uh, the, the innovation that drives us is, is what we call our fact book, which is the one source of truth. In other words, a secure, singular place where you find both all of your financial and non-financial data, which then allows you to do all of the slicing and dicing that you then need to be able to communicate internally and externally on, on what you're doing and how you're measuring and how well you're doing, and do your benchmarking and all the other stuff. I'd say that's for today. Um, the future, uh, at least as we see it, is semantic data modeling. Okay, which is perhaps not a term that everybody here is real familiar with, but what it basically means is rendering data much more accessible to the non-experts, allowing the non-experts to be able to go into your systems and ask questions with their own layman's terms and still get a meaningful answer. And so I would say uh, watch this space because I, I definitely, I'm convinced that that will be the future of our data modeling, at least as far as WorkEve is concerned. Okay, that's great. Great job, panel. That was fantastic.